Week two of the XFL, week two of the power rankings. Yes, we're back again with some thrilling XFL discussion over potentially thrilling NCAA football 14 gameplay. I haven't actually recorded the gameplay yet as I'm recording this, uh, but I continue to have fun watching the XFL and making these rankings, so I will continue to do so. So let's find out where I was wrong last week and maybe even where I was right. This is the XFL week two power rankings. I didn't think this would happen either. Cue the celebration. Yes, the Tampa Bay Vipers take the wooden spoon in these rankings yet again. It was a second underwhelming performance from Tampa and a second extremely underwhelming performance from Vipers quarterbacks. They've gone through three different options now, this week giving the nod to Taylor Cornelius. Cornelius went 16 of 27 for 154 yards and two picks. They tried Quentin Flowers again, and he only threw three completions for 18 yards and a pick. The Vipers look lost out there. They have solid weapons at the skill positions, but no quarterback to get them the ball. Their offensive line isn't good enough to facilitate a winning running game. Their play calling hasn't been great, taking all these things into account. And their defense struggles to force turnovers or rush the quarterback. The Vipers just haven't shown me anything to make me believe they're anything less than the worst team in the XFL right now. But of course, that can always change. And I bragged about where I was right, so now it's time for me to eat my pride and admit where I was wrong. Last week, I put the New York Guardians at number one in my rankings. There was so much about them I liked, and I claimed their clear weakness offensively, that being Matt McGloin at quarterback, wouldn't be exploited so easily. Well, I was wrong. McGloin was dreadful this week, going eight, eight of 19 for 44 yards and two picks, and that was before he started criticizing his team and coaching decisions. Their offense was absolutely shambolic, struggling to throw the ball and even more to run it. I claimed their running game looked bad because of an underrated Vipers defense. Uh, no, it's just bad. I claimed their defense was lethal, rushing the quarterback and forcing turnovers with the best of them. Uh, the Vipers just aren't very good. I used the eye test to prove the Guardians were better than people thought. Now every test imaginable proves they're not. At number six, we've got the LA Wildcats, whose 0-2 start is not necessarily indicative of how good they can be. Last week, they lost to a very, very good Houston Roughnecks team who will, once again, finish high on this list. This week, they suffered a narrow defeat to a Renegades team that welcomed in one of the most exciting players in the XFL. Meanwhile, the Wildcats were trying to work in their own exciting QB talent in Josh Johnson. Johnson played almost polar opposite from Chad Kanoff, who couldn't get the job done last week against the Roughnecks. Johnson played well against Dallas, completing 53% of his passes for 200 yards and two TDs. LA's biggest concern is gonna be their running game, as there are better passing defenses than Dallas out there. LA is going to be a victim of their early schedule, as they play three of the four best teams in the league in their first three games. But once the road gets a bit easier, don't be surprised to see LA rising up these rankings. In at number five is the Seattle Dragons. Now, I was going to put them at least a spot higher, but I learned from last week, don't trust a team just because they beat the Vipers. Once again, Brandon Silvers was the weak link in the team, going seven of 18 for just 91 yards. Keenan Reynolds looked good this week, and he's maybe the most dynamic player in the XFL. Their running game was balanced, if not supremely dangerous, they rushed the quarterback well, but then so did the Guardians, and they forced turnovers, but then so did the Guardians. This has the look of a five-win team in every way, but their lack of big playability puts them just below average in my rankings. Now, number four is going to be a bit controversial, I think. It's the Dallas Renegades, who move up one spot, but only because the Guardians look so cataclysmic this week. But in reality, I feel the exact same about the Renegades this week as I did last week. They won this week, which is good. Landry Jones was efficient, which is good. Cameron Artis Payne rushed for 100 yards on just 14 attempts and two touchdowns, which is good. But Jones threw two picks and only one touchdown, which is bad. Their defense only forced two sacks and one turnover, which is bad. They gave up two sacks to a pretty weak Wildcats pass rush, which is bad. My interpretation this week is pretty much the same as it was last week. The Renegades look good, but I'm not sold on Landry Jones or their defense. Only time will tell. 
We come to the top three, and before I get on with number three, let me just say the difference between these three teams is almost nothing. As you've already guessed, two of these teams played each other, and it was probably the best game in the XFL yet, and I'm including the first iteration. But we crack on with number three, DC Defenders. Yes, this means a no-loss team will finish behind a one-loss team, but this is why I stress how close these teams really are. I put DC here only because they were good, but they didn't blow me away like their last, like the last two teams. Cardale Jones was good, but not great, completing 62% of his passes for 276 yards and two TDs. Is it sustainable to have Jones throw the ball 37 times in a game? I've been a longtime critic of the former Buckeye, and I don't think so. Hopefully you know I'm okay with being wrong on that point if it turns out that way, but for now, I don't have as much trust in him as I do in the final two QBs I haven't mentioned yet. Running back Danell Pomfrey is excellent, but he hasn't really shown it, and their defense seems to be, well, bang average. They'll get their chances to prove me wrong, but they haven't quite shown themselves to be on the level of our final two teams. And speaking of number two, you've probably already guessed, it's the St. Louis Battlehawks. The Battlehawks came up just short against the Roughnecks and they fought valiantly. Jordan Tamu was phenomenal, going 30 of 37 for 284 yards and three TDs. He played better than Cardell Jones while throwing as many balls against a better defense. But two things hurt St. Louis and ultimately doomed them in that game, turnovers and extra points. Now the first one is obvious, Ta'amu threw two picks, one of which came in the fourth quarter and led to what became the game-winning touchdown. As for the second one, let's just bask in the joy of being able to say extra points potentially cost the team a game and not be talking about a terrible kicker. The Battlehawks went 0 for 4 in the extra point game, and in a 4 point game, that's what will cost you. I think both of those issues are fixable, and in an ideal world, I'd have to Amu throw 7 fewer passes and replace those with some options or gadget plays, because their run game is good and diverse. So the Battlehawks may very well be the best team when it's all said and done, but for now, they were barely bested by our number one team. Yes, the Houston Roughnecks take our top spot. Many of you were probably screaming at your monitors or phones or refrigerators, wherever you watched last week's rankings, that I had underrated the Roughnecks. But the more astute among you, which, I mean, that's all of you, let's be real, probably noticed that I actually talked myself into putting Houston at number one and then just straight up ignored myself for my woefully inaccurate eye test. I gushed about PJ Walker's performance and he put on another masterclass this week. I mentioned how their run game was the worst in the league, but what I meant was least used. In reality, their running game is efficient, if not prolific. Both starting running back James Butler and PJ Walker averaged over four yards a carry this week. I talked about how presumed top receiving weapon Sammy Coates looked shaky, but then directly contradicted myself when I complimented PJ Walker for spreading the ball around, alleviating the stress on Coates, and guess what? He did it again this week. In fact, Walker has now shown two different sides of himself in two different games. Last week, he spread the wealth, throwing four TDs to four different receivers. This week, he picked his main target and he stuck with him. Flanker Cam Phillips may very well be Walker's new main man, as he caught eight balls on 10 targets for 63 yards and three touchdowns. And once again, the Houston defense did its job, recording three sacks and two turnovers on probably the second best quarterback in the league, who's more elusive than love in my life. Yes, I underrated Houston last week and ignored all my own arguments in favor of a Guardians team I just had a feeling was really good. But this week, I'm not making the same mistake. Houston does everything right. They're efficient, they keep the clock moving, and they cut down their opponent's possessions. In a lot of ways, the Battlehawks got the better of them last week, but it was Houston's game planning and execution in crucial scenarios that gave them the win over maybe the toughest competition they'll see all season, at least as far as these rankings are concerned. But if you disagree, and I'm sure you do, let me know in the comments and let's discuss. I'm having so much fun doing this. I hope it's as fun to listen to as it is for me to record. So subscribe for XFL Power Rankings every week. And of course, all of GA Sports content now and in the future. We appreciate you.